Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. We are delighted to have Mr. Chan Chun Singh, Minister for Trade and Industry of Singapore, to grace this event. Welcome, sir. On behalf of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, NUS, Le Suc d'Economist, and Economic Society of Singapore, we would like to welcome you to the Singapore France Economic Forum 2019, New Horizons for the World Economy. My name is Gail, and I'm a research associate of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and it is my honor to be your MC for this event. To begin the program, it is my pleasure to invite the Dean of Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and Lee Kashim Professor in Economics, Professor Danny Kwa, to deliver his welcome remarks. Dean, please. Minister Chan Chun Singh, Minister for Trade and Industry, Singapore. Minister Michel Sapin, previously Minister for Economy and Finance, France. Mr. Chatip Basri, previously Minister for Finance, Indonesia. Mr. Marc Abansu, Ambassador of France to Singapore. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to New Horizons for the World Economy, the 2019 France-Singapore Economic Forum that's been jointly organized by the Economic Society of Singapore, the French Circle of Economists, and the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy here at the National University of Singapore. From wherever we sit, when we look out into the world economy, the topic that we will be treating these two days, most of us see only trouble ahead. It is said that the potential retreat from the global system of some of the great powers of the world will lead to the breakdown of global cooperation and international rule of law. There will be, in that view, disintegration of the rules-based world order. And from where we sit, that might well come to pass. But alternatively, it might be that we're seeing the birth of a new world order one where the demand for world order from the rise of the rest of the world is met by a supply of world order from those nations that are powerful and capable. And it is supply that now appropriately meets that demand. So it might well be that the world order that emerges actually attracts what the American Declaration of Independence refers to as the consent of the governed rather than a system of hegemony. So things looking ahead might therefore not be so bad. But as if one large shock in our lifetimes was not enough, the world economy today faces challenges, the scale and pace of which has not been seen for over two centuries, if not for 10,000 years. Large-scale international migration, global climate change, technological disruption? Will the rise of machines in the form of robotics and artificial intelligence permanently destroy jobs and displace large swath of humanity from gainful employment? Or, alternatively, after the last century of all of us being told by economists that sustained growth required ever higher productivity, and we all ended up wanting higher productivity, we have found higher productivity. Its name is robotics and artificial intelligence. So now, as a result of technological disruption, do we look ahead to a dystopia of ever-rising inequality and the politics of envy? Or alternatively, do we acknowledge that all that higher productivity is for the good, and that as some like to say, the acquisition of wealth will no longer be the driving force in our lives, that we all work better, that we all work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. Now, over these next two days, this meeting will take up a number of these questions, and it will not, we will not, over the course of the next 48 hours, get to resolve all these paradoxes and quandaries, but I am confident that it is through these kinds of cross-national collaborations between France and Singapore, between Europe and Asia, 
between all the different parts of the world through these kinds of discussions that we will make progress. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to the Lee Kuan Yew School and welcome to New Horizons for the World Economy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. We would now like to invite the President of the Economic Society of Singapore, Professor Houston Kwa, to deliver his welcome remarks. Professor Kwa, please. Good morning, everyone. I'm often asked whether Danny and me are related. We share the same surname, so I thought I'll dispel your curiosity. Uh, we are not, but we're related by discipline, of course, economics. We actually have the, from the same school and the same town, hometown. So uh, I hope to, uh, that satisfies uh, you know. Our distinguished uh, speaker and guest of honor, Mr. Chan Chun Singh, Minister for Trade and Industry. Mr. Michel Sepan, former French Minister for the Economy and Finance. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to the second edition of the Le Contra du Carmi in Singapore. This unique event is a collaboration between the Economic Society of Singapore LESEC and the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. The first edition was a by invitation closed door event which featured discussions between high level speakers from France and Singapore. For this second edition, I'm glad to see that this event is now open to the public for registration with a wider panel of excellent speakers. Before touching on the theme of the event, I would like to say a few words, especially to our guests about the Economic Society of Singapore. Established in 1956, the Economic Society of Singapore is a non-profit organization of economists, professionals, academicians, and policymakers with a common interest in economics. The primary objective of the society is to raise public awareness and stimulate public interest and debate in economic issues and challenges that are relevant to Singapore and the region. The society also looks across borders in its approach to encourage dialogue. This event will be the first of many such efforts for 2019. Later in the year, the Society will be hosting the 44th Federation of the ASEAN Economic Associations Conference. The Society's journal, the Singapore Economic Review, is one of the few journals based in Asia, indexed in the Social Sciences Citation Index. The activities of the journal culminate with the biannual Singapore Economic Review Conference. The 8th Singapore Economic Review Conference will be held this year from the 5th to the 7th of August. Past speakers have included Nobel laureates and prominent economists. This year is no different. And we have Barry Eichengreen from Berkeley, Robert Starvins from Harvard, Harold Ulick from Chicago, and many others. In the spirit of the Le Contra, I encourage our French counterparts to send a strong contingent to the conference if possible. Now, the theme of the Le Contra economy is new horizons for the, whole e for the world economy. The world is experiencing a new era of technological innovation, adaptation, and coalescence, forming an accelerated global network effect of opportunities, risks, and uncertainties. This is something that Singapore, a small and open economy, cannot ignore. Now, who better to exploit the innovation, seize opportunities, and take risks than the movers of economic growth? The entrepreneurs and the innovators. One might maintain that there are sound policies in place for entrepreneurship to flourish in Singapore. On the passive side, business-friendly policies are prevalent. On the active side, there is a financing of basic research. Others might caution that entrepreneurship is constrained in Singapore due to its small size, the lack of immediate access to global markets, and society's risk aversion. How might we approach these constraints? priming potential entrepreneurs to regional opportunities and growth, and leveraging on well-established trade partnerships will be a good start. These entrepreneurs and continued foreign investments will need a strong workforce that is future economy ready. This presents a multifold challenge. Whether it is a digital, sharing, or platform economy, one would hope, the creativity of the human mind and dexterity of the human hands will continue to play a part in the economy, albeit with augmentation from automation and robots. The accelerating network effect will require individuals to, open, to be open to accelerating disruptions through lifelong learning and global mindset. Danny talks about this in his speech. Policymakers must be wary about the pushbacks that such disruptions will bring 
and this may cause society to detrimentally become more risk averse and insular. Possible wage disparities arising from winner-take-all scenarios of the network effect is another factor to consider in policy decisions. I thought it would be worthwhile to draw upon related observations through my own involvement in a research program on autonomous electromobility, or what is commonly known as self-driving electric vehicles. This program is a joint collaboration between Nanyang Technological University and the Technical University of Munich. The benefits of autonomous vehicles will not just come solely from their introduction, but mainly through global network effect of adopting the technology into improving existing or creating new product services and business models. We are already seeing global players and startups setting themselves up to harvest this network effect in the areas of ride sharing, retail and delivery of services. Other industries will likely be disrupted. For example, it may be fundamentally it may fundamentally change the way we finance transport purchases and insurance or influence the way we design and build our real estates and energy infrastructures. Besides transport science, technology and engineering, the research program also incorporates design and the social sciences as a core unit. Innovation is not complete without the necessary user and behavioral insights. This requires multidisciplinary researchers collaborating across many parallel research tracks. Ultimately, the research program hopes to contribute towards the next generation of public transport systems in Singapore. I look forward to some of these issues being discussed here. Over the next two days, speakers and audience from various segments will contribute views and ideas from different areas of expertise. This would no doubt improve upon the stock of information that is so crucial in charting out new horizons. The world is facing many facets of accelerated change and along with it, the future economy will be very different from the present or the near present one. Nothing is cast in stone. Not the standard model in physics, the periodic table in chemistry, and the central dogma in biology, nor even the way conventional economics predicts human behavior. The more knowledge is consumed, shared, or disseminated, the more it will renew itself and be radiated out in an ever-widening space, leading to, of course, greater innovation, experimentation, greater dynamism. The static economy is now a dynamic economy, and this in turn shapes the future economy. It is my hope that the event will provide a platform for productive and intellectually engaging discourse. My thanks to the event's corporate sponsors and special thanks to our academic partner, the Singapore University of Social Sciences, the GIC, and so on, for their strong support. I would like to extend my appreciation to the organizing team from LASAC, the LKY School, and the Society for making this possible. And once again, I thank our guest of honor, Mr. Chan, for his presence here. And I thank all our eminent speakers for their invaluable insights today, and you, the audience, for attending this event. On that note, I wish all participants a fruitful and enjoyable day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kwa. We would now like to invite Ms. Claire Waysand of the Lusa d'Economies to deliver her welcome remarks. Ms. Waysand, please. Ministers, uh, distinguished audience, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to be speaking here, and uh, you will apologize that I'm, I'm speaking in English. Uh, a great pleasure to be speaking here at Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. A great pleasure also to be speaking after Danny Kwa, who was a former professor of mine several years ago at the London School of Economics, and, and Houston Kwa, with whom we have very close relationship. So thank you very much first to the co-organizer, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and uh, the Economic Society of Singapore. Um, as was mentioned before, the first edition was in 2016, and we felt, together with the co-organizers, that it was time to have a second edition. As the circle of the, of the Economist, the French equivalent of the Economic Society, uh, we are very keen on engaging in global debates. We very much believe that at this juncture, a number of issues are global, and that to make them make progress, we need to have a candid exchange of view between partners who may not always think similarly from the outset, but who will always gain from the exchange. Seen here from Singapore, globalization may, be, may seem very obvious. 
Uh, indeed, if there is a, a state in the world that has benefited from globalization, we are, we, we are in it. I don't need to uh, recall all, all the, the impressive statistics on the rankings of Singapore on various scales, be it in terms of the size of its harbor, its GDP per inhabitant, or, um, or, or the size of its financial sector. So Singapore has everything to gain from a global world that works. At the same time, there are a number of debates on globalization. These debates arise both in academic spheres and sometimes in political discussions. Because we don't want this discussion to be confined to politicians who play on fear and who, who, have, uh, who, who, who have an incentive to uh, want people to look inward and not outward, because we think that uh, we, we need to answer these questions, we are very happy to have these two days meeting ahead. So as Danny Kwa mentioned, we're not going to solve all the issues that are on the table. Uh, I, I will mention a few of them just to make sure that we touch upon them in the next, uh, next few days. The, the development of inequality is an issue. As we know, globalization has enabled a lot of catching up in the world economy and has left out of poverty a number of people around the world. At the same time, it has sometimes produced an increase in inequalities within countries and that creates tensions and backlash pressures. Another issue is the financial interdependence across economies. This, of course, enables more development in a number of emerging economies, but it's also a factor that can be very destabilizing, in particular for emerging economies. Tax competition is another issue. And the fact that because of, of globalization, it's harder and harder to tax mobile bases, thus pushing taxation towards less mobile bases, such as companies which are unable to optimize their tax uh, tax behavior or households. This is clearly a global issue. Innovation brings its lot of issue, as Danny Kwa mentioned, and Houston Kwa as well. We, we are in a world where the winner takes all, plays a strong role, building very large companies, and these very large companies have new powers, including an unprecedented access to our individual data. And finally, as economists, we're used to thinking that globalization is good in an aggregate way, but that we, we need to compensate those who are losers from globalization. Uh, this is, I this is, uh, would say, uh, traditional thinking, but what we have noticed, what experience shows, is that it's not always easy to compensate the losers. And this is something we are experiencing throughout our, our countries and which has also been noticed by leading economists uh, like Olivier Blanchard, who was chief economist from the IMF and who, who has, of course, no protectionist uh, views at all. So these are all important questions. Uh, we, we will not necessarily solve all of them and probably not solve all of them. Uh, but our sense is that we have everything to gain from an exchange of views among ourselves in the next few days. And because we feel that the global challenges ahead of us require cooperative answers, we very much look forward towards a cooperative, candid discussion among all the speakers and the audience in the next few days. So thank you very much all to you for your participation. And without due delay, I will leave the floor to the next speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wayson. We would now like to invite, invite Mr. Michel Sapan, former Minister of Economy and Finance of France, to deliver his opening remarks. Mr. Sapan, please. I beg your pardon, but uh, I will speak in French. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much for the organizers to have invited me to come, and thank you very much to the minister for being here today. I, uh, I salute you. You are, you are very much in activity today, and I have the comfort now of no longer working. And uh, I know that how time is very important for us, and the responsibilities are very heavy for us. And maybe sometimes in a minute by minute, it's thank you very much for your presence here today. And thank you all the uh, guests here and all the participants. It is my honor to uh, open, uh, after the organizers, this debate. And we are going to do this in a dialogue session with the minister. And I would like to try um, to show you my point of view as a European, a European who is convinced, a Frenchman, and uh, to tell you a few days about how is, is, a, is a world economy today and how is globalization today. I will do it in three remarks. The first remark that I have is uh, for everyone has to be conscious about this in, in countries like yours where globalization is evident and it's an evidence for in its benefits. Uh, and today in a bigger part of the world, especially in Europe and also in the United States, there is a crisis, there's a very deep crisis of, of globalization. And this crisis is not only a technical crisis, it's not only a crisis due to, uh, for example, uh, uh, disorder in a, in a financial system uh, or in other technological uh, advances that could have you know, given us questions of, for us to have a certain level of development and to have a certain capacity to develop and that we have seen before in the past. It's a crisis which is a lot deeper because it's a sense. It's, what is a sense? of globalization. What is the meaning of globalization? It's, uh, what is the meaning for our people? And uh, it is because this globalization has lost its meaning and because there is no more conscientious uh, way of, of, of looking at globalization because the globalization crisis is a, is a very, very important crisis. It is not an economic crisis. It is not only a scientific crisis. It is also a political crisis and what is the capacity that the people have to, to look at themselves with this globalization? And what is the capacity to find a future in this globalization? And for countries, all countries, for example, like ours, and for countries that have known uh, the 30 glorious years uh, with a great capacity of, uh, of um, GDP increasing in the, in, 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 tremendously, and for the past 10 years, no a stagnation in their GDP since the crisis, it is a very important question. This in globalization crisis uh, uh, shows that in the, in, in the commercial ways, we have various uh, requests and a lot of uh, challenges and a lot of uh, ruptures and a lot of uh, refusals to, to, to be in a framework, to have a multilateral way of finding solutions that, uh, to, for, the, for the problems that we may face. And it's also globalization that makes us question the, uh, the, the, the engine of globalization and, and a reply to globalization and, a, and various regional uh, uh, in integration like the European integration. And I, I know that we have something called Brexit and we, maybe you don't know that, what the real meaning of Brexit and I'm sure that the British people don't know what they're doing. But it shows that we sometimes can lose the reason in a world which is uh, in, in, in an overall changing mood. It, so this crisis that we have to see as, as such is not a, sm a small moment in life or maybe we could get out of uh, while waiting, uh, time is going by, or we can find some solutions. It's a time which is a, deci a decisive moment. We need regardless of the situation in the countries that we have, we need to know together what are the solutions, we need to find solutions to this crisis because it's a second point of my intervention today. This globalization remains evident for all of us. It's uh, not only today uh, compared to yesterday, but it is the level where uh, a big problems that we have, we're facing to the big problems that can be solved. I think uh, or maybe we can bring some, some answers to, like, for example, I think, of course, uh, the climate change or the trend, the, uh, the, um, yeah, the, the climate change is, is it's quite a big problem. We have no borders for this, for this problem. Of course, the weather has no, and, and climate has no border. So we need to find a unified answer at the, at the world level. And also, 
when we look at uh, increased safety and security as a finance minister, uh, in terms of finances, of, in terms of terrorism and uh, fight against terrorism, we know that if we want to have more security and more safety for all our states, the answer is not uh, uh, from one state only. It's a coordinated answer. We need to put in place various mechanisms to avoid um, or to combat uh, uh, terrorism, the financing of terrorism, and also about various technical advances that we have seen, uh, various it is uh, uh, knowledge, uh, uh, capacity on various networks, world networks, to see that, that, see that, uh, that a lot of knowledge is being spread around the world and we don't have an answer like a web, for example. We have a world vision on this regulation and we have seen we have the various advances between France and, uh, and your country that show that this, at this level that we can uh, um, reply to these uh, uh, challenges that we face today. So we have a crisis, a globalization in crisis, but a globalization which is very important and on big problems today that the problem the world, world faces today, it's the third point of this um, uh, presentation now after the, before the discussion we're going to have, what are the conditions that I would call a, a remodeling of the globalization? It's not a repair. It's not repairing the, glo the, 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 the few uh, defects that we have or a few uh, screws that we have to, to tighten, but we need to, to think again of this uh, globalization. First of all, it's not new. We have to accept and put in place this this regulation globalization, we cannot have globalization without a regulation which is adapted to this globalization. It's not new because in, for example, in the financial domain, these regulations are, are, have gone forward in the past few years and everybody has seen that we need to have this regulation in place to, to avoid the catastrophes and uh, various uh, violent movements that we have seen or, or we may face in the future. And this regulation must be accepted not as a way to, as, as, an obliga as an obligatory, but as a way to mm, render globalization a sane, uh, a stabilizing effect, and a good uh, working of this globalization. It's, it's true in, in the monetary and the financial aspects. It's also true in, in, the, in the trade, and because of all the various problems that we have, social and environment problems that we face. So we need to go forward in a freedom uh, exchange of uh, the commerce and uh, with various criteria which are linked to the environment that are a more, lot more complex and, comp and, and, and complicated and uh, that we have to put in place and, 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 in pla and, and implement and also make respect. And also in the fiscal reglementation that we have, I, uh, uh, I was the French minister who signed the International Convention on the Exchange of Information. Singapore is also a member of this um, uh, instrument. It's a, it's, a, it's a will, it's a positive will to enable this globalization and a transfer of uh, financial movements and uh, and one way for the, the richest part of the world, for example, the France, and for companies to avoid taxation, which is necessary for the good uh, working of our societies. Uh, globalization, which accepts as a fundamental element of its understanding and its uh, uh, regulation, regulation which is not compulsory, but a, 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 it's a voluntary uh, regulation. It's a, it's a fundamental way of looking at this globalization. We also have to, it's, uh, it's a subject that is being touched upon now that uh, this couple of globalization and inequalities have to be addressed with one, in one way. For all our people, globalization today is synonymous to the, uh, these inequalities, the increase of inequalities which is true that uh, the globalization is not the, uh, the, uh, the source of inequalities, but they were there before. But in many countries, and from country to country, this increase of uh, inequalities has become un untainable. It is because of globalization that inequalities are becoming deeper in Europe, and I think it's, 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 it's wrong. It's not true. But there is also a part which is true. So there's a, there is a necessity to look at these inequalities to 
to, to haul them, to, to manage them, and to reduce them. And also, it's a, it's a vital uh, element in this globalization process, which I think is, is necessary. And then the most complicated part of globalization is identity. What, how do our people who have their own history and old culture and our identity, and sometimes these different identities, uh, because our countries know this very well, that we have different kind of identities, different religions, different stories. How, uh, in, in this open world, how can we all contain, uh, keep this, uh, what does it mean to be French, for example, in globalization, or French in Europe, for example, or how is it to be uh, a citizen of your country in Asia, but also in the world? And this question of uh, and that's to be anchored onto something which gives us a strength to be part of this globalization, the strength to, to be ourselves in this globalization process. And it is the most delicate and most difficult part, point that we have. And it shows that uh, what is happening uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the British Isles, for example, but I think that many British citizens didn't uh, uh, see what their identity was in the global, in, 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 uh, in, in, in an open country, which is now closing itself compared to Europe because there is this fear of losing their identity, it's the fear to lose what being British is. And then we're very far from that economic question, but also we know that economy is not a, a different science. It is a, it's a science which is also linked to various other elements and, and of course to build the identity of various countries. So these are the few words that I wanted to share with you, Mr. Minister and ladies and gentlemen. And there is a globalization that is quite happy it is seen as a as a as a as a reward, reward to efforts, to modernization, a reward to new ways of li of living. But also, uh, there's also some the the opposite, like punishment, a uh, punishment compared to I don't know what. But uh, it's a it's a it's a. We need to know today that we have to go beyond this uh, this this globalization, which is a happy one, and this globalization, which is a very unhappy one. Because if we continue with the two separate worlds, the, the, the happy and the unhappy globalization will be, will be, will be won against with uh, unhappy globalization for the most of us. So we need to work this very hard. Thank you very much for your attention. Mr. Sapan. We would now like to invite Mr. Minister Chan Chun Singh, the Minister for Trade and Industry of Singapore, to deliver his opening remarks. Minister, please. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. Thank you for this invitation to speak and share perspectives on the world economy. Our world is at a crossroads. Leaders and people in every country have a choice to make. Do we seize the opportunities for greater integration to continue to uplift the livelihoods of millions, or do we adopt measures protectionist measures, and threaten the possible gains brought about by technology and connectivity. In a sense, we are not very different from a time about 100 years ago in the 1920s, where the world had to make hard choices between integration with consequential shifts in global production and value chains or isolationism to protect the status quo and forego the positive net gains for everyone. Similar to the 1920s, we will once again have to see if politics will defeat economics. As a graduate of Cambridge University, I was taught since young that we never separate politics from economics. And I think that's very much what Mr. Michel Sapan has mentioned just now. Technological advances in communications, computing power, artificial intelligence, advanced manufacturing, robotics, supply chain optimization, biologics, medical sciences, and so forth, have all put the human race on the cups of a new revolution in production 
and consumption. The question is, can we seize these new opportunities to usher in a new era of growth? All the technological opportunities mentioned are also threatening the previous and existing models and patterns of production and consumption. While there are real net positive benefits for the world and for the respective countries, it does not mean that it has or it will easily translate into net positive benefits for all individuals especially those in the middle class with the middle skills. <clears throat> in various countries, the middle class is falling backwards. This has grave economic and political implications. The fracturing of the middle class will also certainly fracture the political centre. This fracturing of the political centre will also be accentuated by a few set of forces. First, the event of narrow casting of messages to appeal to the primordial fears and aspirations of our people. Second, the propulsion of new populist leaders to the fore on the basis of promises of quick fixes. Third, the shortening and shallowing of the public's attention span in a world inundated by information and disinformation. All these factors combine to threaten sound governance, which is needed to establish the stable conditions required for global economic growth, success and cooperation. Without steady improvements in the livelihoods of the populace, we cannot expect to have an informed public who will put the long-term interests of the society ahead of the short-term ones. Neither can we expect them to support a stable leadership that will reject short-term populism. Without a strong political centre, countries and leaders will not be able to make difficult and bold trade-offs for the long term. Without countries being strong and internally coherent, we should also not expect strong and coherent international leadership for a rules-based, open and integrated global system. Hence, we are at risk and we can be in for a steep downward spiral just as in the 1920s if we don't get both our economics and politics right. These two set of forces, economics and politics, can be positively or negatively reinforcing depending on our choices of its trajectory. To get both of them right, we need to rethink how we redistribute the benefits of globalisation, how we rejuvenate our industries and how we revitalise our global rules. To redistribute the fruits of globalisation, we must have the political will and means to significantly invest in the training of our people and reorganise our education and training systems. Many across the world have focused on the redistribution issue by discussing how to solve inequality alone. Inequality is important to fix, but immobility is even more important and harder to fix. We must not just try to do better in sharing with everyone the fish caught today, but we must also be able to teach the rest how to catch their own fish tomorrow and to give them the confidence that they can do so by themselves. It is one thing to be poor at a moment in time. It is another thing to have no hope to be rich forever in the future.
and that may be a deeper problem and that may be a deeper reason to the discontent around the world. Too many countries have not paid sufficient attention to the lifelong education and continuous training of our people to help them keep pace with a fast-changing economic environment. Without skills, without new skills, there can be no hope for a better future. Without hope for a better future, there can be no strong political centre, no strong support for long-term coherent leadership at the country level, and certainly no clear leadership on the global stage. To rejuvenate our industries, we must accept that we all need to re-engineer our production and supply chains to better integrate with the shifts in the global production and value chains. Our aim cannot be to protect jobs alone, but our real aim must be to protect the workers. The best protection for our workers is not to defend yesterday's or today's job. Instead, it is to make sure that our industries are creating tomorrow's jobs and our people are equipped with the skills to fulfill these roles. Industry policy are not intended to shelter all industries from change, but are intended to create new opportunities for our people through new technologies, new forms of connectivity and new business models. Finally, we need to revitalize the rules-based global trading system. We need fresh agreements to sustain existing global trade in goods and services, taking into account the changed realities of the global production system. We also need a strong and fair arbitration system to upkeep the rules made. But we most urgently need new rules for the new economy, the digital economy. We cannot apply old mindsets to new technologies and opportunities. For example, I shudder when people see data as a consumable and apply geographical boundaries to control its usage. Data is not a consumable in the old sense where consumption by an individual deprives another of it. On the contrary, Consumption and utilization of data is additive. It brings new value and new opportunities to create new products and services, often at low or zero marginal cost. This fundamentally changes the way we view data. We should not view data as a resource where consumption is subtractive rather than additive. Singapore is encouraged by the efforts at the WTO to define the new rules for the new digital and data-enabled economy. It allows countries like Singapore to transcend our geographical size and location. Countries will increasingly not be separated by distance, but united by systems and connectivity. Today's forum is an example. France and Singapore are not separated by systems, but united, not separated by distance, but united by system and values. Singapore today, with Australia and Japan, are leading the negotiations and will work with like-minded countries to develop the new rules for the global digital economy. So ladies and gentlemen, we are once again at a crossroad for the global economy. We all have a choice to make individually and collectively. We have a shared responsibility to get things right for our people. We do not want to repeat history 100 years ago and regress towards isolationism and risk another Great Depression. Instead, the great digital frontier can unite us and bring us all to greater heights. But if we apply the wrong concepts, we risk the great balkanization instead. The European forefathers had the guts and gumption to embark on the European Union, or as some would call it, the European experiment. It was a statement of integration and collaboration for greater good. It was not premised on the fact that all European countries were the same. It was premised on the fact that even though all the European countries 
are different at different stages of development that each and every one can leverage on their respective strengths to come together to build a better Europe. And this is the theory of comparative advantage in economics. And this great experiment, this great work, has delivered much for Europe and the world. Today, the challenges in Europe, as in America and Asia, are the same. Do we want to reap the benefits of globalization and greater integration through greater connectivity? But more importantly, do we have the political will to reorganize our education and training system, rejuvenate our industries to create the old and not just to protect, to create the new and not just to protect the old, and revitalize the global training system by taking into account the changed realities and taking into account the new challenges ahead brought about by the digital economy. May we all make the right and wise choice for ourselves, our country and our world. Thank you very much.